welcome. Apologies for the uh, different format tonight. We're having a few technological issues with our camera. But I just wanted to give you a small overview of the two stories we have lined up for Halloween. Uh, both of these stories are by Frances Marion Crawford. So a little bit about the author. Frances Marion Crawford was born in Italy, and in 1879 he went to India, where he studied Sanskrit and edited the Allahabad Indian Herald. After that, he went to the U.S., where he again studied Sanskrit at Harvard University. After a brief residence in New York and Boston, he returned to Italy, where he made his permanent home. Uh, he published many historical works, and he also published many novels on the horror and occult, of one of which we are reading tonight. One of them is The Screaming Skull. It's told from the viewpoint of a retired sailor who has inherited his cousin's house after the unfortunate passing of that branch of the family. And he is telling his old friend about the history of why there is this thing screaming in the middle of the night. And it has to do with terrible husbands and knowing when you shouldn't tell murder stories at the dinner table. So, let's get into that, shall we? The Screaming Skull by Frances Marion Crawford I have often heard it scream. No, I am not nervous. I am not imaginative. And I never believed in ghosts unless that thing is one. Whatever it is, it hates me almost as much as it hated Luke Pratt. And it screams at me. If I were you, I would never tell ugly stories about ingenious ways of killing people, for you can never tell but that someone at the table may be tired of his or her nearest and dearest. I have always blamed myself for Mrs. Pratt's death, and I suppose I was responsible for it in a way, though heaven knows I never wished her anything but long life and happiness. If I had not told that story, she might be alive yet. That is why the thing screams at me, I fancy. She was a good little woman with a sweet temper, all things considered, and a nice, gentle voice. But I remember hearing her shriek once when she thought her little boy was killed by a pistol that went off, though everyone was sure that it was not loaded. It was the same scream, exactly the same, with a sort of rising quaver at the end. Do you know what I mean? Unmistakable. The truth is, I had not realized that the doctor and his wife were not on good terms. I used to bicker a bit now and then when I was here, and I often noticed that little Mrs. Pratt got very red and bit her lip hard to keep her temper. But Luke grew pale and said the most offensive things. He was that sort when he was in the nursery, I remember, and afterwards at school. He was my cousin, you know. That is how I came by this house, after he died, and his little boy Charlie was killed in South Africa. There were no relations left. Yes, it's a pretty little property, just the sort of thing for an old sailor like me who was taken to gardening. One always remembers one's mistakes, much more vividly than the one's cleverest things, doesn't one? I've often noticed it. I was dining with the Pratts one night, when I told them the story that afterwards made so much difference. It was a wet night in November, and the sea was moaning. Hush, if you don't speak, you will hear it now. Do you hear the tide? gloomy sound, isn't it? Sometimes about this time of year. Hello, there it is. Don't be frightened, man. It won't eat you. It's only a noise, after all. But I'm glad you've heard it, because there are always people who think it's the wind or my imagination or something. You won't hear it again tonight, I fancy, for it doesn't often come more than once. Yes, that's right. Put another stick on the fire and a little more stuff into that weak mixture you're so fond of. Do you remember old Blocklot, the carpenter, on that German ship that picked us up when the Clontarf went to the bottom? We were hove to in a howling gale one night, as snug as you please, with no land within five hundred miles, and the ship coming up and falling off as regularly as clockwork. Pity the poor people ashore to night, the boys, old Blocklot sang out as he went off to his quarters with the sailmaker. I often think of that now, now that I'm ashore for good and all. Yes, it was on a night like this, when I was at home for a spell, waiting to take the Olympia out on her first trip was on the next voyage that she broke the record, you remember, but that dates it. Ninety-two was the year, early in November. The weather was dirty, Pratt was out of temper, and the dinner was bad, very bad indeed, which didn't improve matters, and cold, which made it worse. 
The poor little lady was very unhappy about it, and insisted on making a Welsh rarebit on the table to counteract the raw turnips and half-boiled mutton. Pratt must have had a hard day. Perhaps he had lost a patient. At all events, he was in a nasty temper. My wife is trying to poison me, you see, he said. She'll succeed some day. I saw that she was hurt, and I made believe to laugh, and said that Mrs. Pratt was much too clever to get rid of her husband in such a simple way. And then I began to tell them about Japanese tricks with spun glass and chopped horse hair and the like. Pratt was a doctor, and knew a lot more than I did about such things. But that only put me on my mettle, and I told a story about a woman in Ireland who did for three husbands before anyone suspected foul play. Did you never hear that tale? The fourth husband managed to keep awake and caught her, and she was hanged. How did she do it? She drugged them and poured melted lead into their ears through a little horn funnel when they were asleep. No, that's the wind whistling. It's backing up to the southward again. I can tell by the sound. Besides, the other thing doesn't often come more than once in the evening, even at this time of year, when it happened. Yes, it was in November. Poor Mrs. Pratt died suddenly in her bed not long after I dined there. I can fix the date, because I got the news in New York by the steamer that followed the Olympia when I took her out on her first trip. You had the Leofric the same year. Yes, I remember. What a pair of old buffers we are coming to be, you and I. Nearly fifty years since we were apprentices together in the Clontarf. Shall you ever forget old Blacklot? Pity the poor people ashore, boys. Ha <laughs> ha. Take a little more with all that water. It's the old host camp I found in the cellar when this house came to me. The same I brought Luke from Amsterdam five and twenty years ago. He had never touched a drop of it. Perhaps he's sorry now, poor fellow. Where did I leave off? I told you that Mrs. Pratt died suddenly, yes? Luke must have been very lonely here after she was dead, I should think. I came to see him now and then, and he looked worn and nervous, and told me that his practice was growing too heavy for him, though he wouldn't take an assistant on any account. Years went on, and his son was killed in South Africa, and after that he began to be queer. There was something about him not like other people. I believe he kept his senses in this profession to the end. There was no complaint of his having made mad mistakes in cases or anything of that sort. But he had a look about him. Luke was a red-headed man with a pale face when he was young, and he was never stout. In middle age he turned to sandy gray, and after his son died he grew thinner and thinner, till his head looked like a skull with parchment stretched over it very tight and his eyes had a sort of glare in them that was very disagreeable to look at. He had an old dog that poor Mrs. Pratt had been fond of, and that used to follow her everywhere. He was a bulldog and the sweetest-tempered beast you ever saw, though he had a way of hitching his upper lip behind one of his fangs that frightened strangers a good deal. Sometimes, of an evening, Pratt and Bumble, that was the dog's name, used to sit and look at each other a long time, thinking about old times, I suppose. When Luke's wife used to sit in that chair you've got. That was always her place, and this was the doctor's, where I'm sitting. Bumble used to climb up by the footstool, he was old and fat by that time, and could not jump much, and his teeth were getting shaky. He looked steadily at Luke, and Luke looked steadily at the dog, his face growing more and more like a skull, with two little coals for eyes. And after about five minutes or so, though it may have been less, Old Bumble would suddenly begin to shake all over, and all on a sudden, he would set up an awful howl as if he'd been shot, and tumble out of the easy chair and trot away, and hide himself under the sideboard and lie there making odd noises. Considering Pratt's looks in those last months, the thing is not surprising, you know. I'm not nervous or imaginative, but I can quite believe he might have set a sensitive woman into hysterics. His head looks so much like a skull in parchment. At last I came down one day before Christmas, when my ship was in dock, and I had three weeks off. Bumble was not about, and I said casually that I supposed the old dog was dead. Yes, Pratt answered, and I thought there was something odd in his tone, even before he went on after a little pause. I killed him, he said presently. I could stand it no longer. I asked what it was that Luke could not stand, though I guessed well enough. He had a way of sitting in her chair and glaring at me, then howling. Luke shivered a little. He didn't suffer at all, poor old Bumble. He went on in a hurry, as if he thought I might imagine that he had been cruel. I put dinine in his drink to make him sleep soundly, 
and then I chloroformed him gradually, so that he could not have felt suffocated even if he was dreaming. It's been quieter since then. I wondered what he meant, for the words slipped out as if he could not help saying them. I've understood since. He meant that he did not hear the noise so often after the dog was out of the way. Perhaps he thought at first that it was old Bumble in the yard howling at the moon, though it's not that kind of noise, is it? Besides, I know what it is if Luke didn't. It's only a noise after all, and a noise never hurt anybody yet. But he was much more imaginative than I am. No doubt there is really something about this place that I don't understand, but when I don't understand a thing, I call it a phenomenon, and I don't take it for granted that it's going to kill me as he did. I don't understand everything, by long odds, nor do you, nor does any man who's been to sea. We used to talk of tidal waves, for instance, and we could not account for them. Now we account for them by calling them submarine earthquakes, and we branch off into fifty theories. Any one of them might make earthquakes quite comprehensible if we only knew what they were. I fell in with one of them once, and the inkstand flew straight up from the table against the ceiling of my cabin. The same thing happened to Captain Lucky. I dare say you've read about it in his wrinkles. Very good. If that sort of thing took place ashore, in this room for instance, a nervous person would probably talk about spirits and levitation and fifty things that mean nothing, instead of just quietly setting it down as a phenomenon that has not been explained yet. My view of that voice, you see. Besides, what is there to prove that Luke killed his wife? I would not even suggest such a thing to anyone but you. After all, there was nothing but the coincidence that poor little Mrs. Pratt died suddenly in her bed a few days after I told that story at dinner. She was not the only woman who ever died like that, and they agreed that she had died of something the matter with her heart. Why not? It's common enough. Of course, there was the ladle. I never told anybody about that, and it made me start when I found it in the cupboard in the bedroom. It was new, too, a little tinned iron ladle. That had not been in the fire more than once or twice. And there was some lead in it that had been melted and stuck to the bottom of the bowl, all gray with hardened dross on it. But that proves nothing. A country doctor is generally a handyman who does everything for himself. And Luke may have had a dozen reasons for melting a little lead in the ladle. He was fond of sea fishing, for instance, and he may have cast a sinker for a night line. Perhaps it was a wait for the hall clock or something like that. All the same, when I found it, I had a rather queer sensation. Because it looks so much like the thing I described when I told them the story. Do you understand? It affected me unpleasantly and I threw it away. It's at the bottom of the sea a mile from the spit, and it'll be jolly well rusted beyond recognizing if it's ever washed up by the tide. You see, Luke must have bought it in the village years ago. For the man sells just such ladles still. I suppose they are used in cooking. In any case, there was no reason why an inquisitive housemaid should find such a thing lying about, with lead in it, and wonder what it was. And perhaps talk to the maid who heard me tell the story at dinner, for that girl married the plumber's son in the village, and you may remember the whole thing. You understand me, don't you? Now that Luke Pratt is dead and gone, and lies buried beside his wife with an honest man's tombstone at his head, I should not care to stir up anything that could hurt his memory. They are both dead and their son, too. There is enough trouble about Luke's death as it was. How? Well, you'll have to read the rest of the story for yourself, if you want to figure out the how, the why, or any of the other uh, things about this story. Well, you'll have to read the rest of the story for yourself, if you want to figure out the how, and why, and where, and when. See what I mean when I said terrible husbands and a very unhappy skull? So you can find this story inside an anthology titled Great Tales of Terror and the Supernatural and the main level at Bowser in the Fiction Area. I hope you enjoy and I hope you'll join us again next time.